Hi, my name is uh, Yahya Ifawi. I'm a pediatrician and neonatologist, and today I'm going to speak about uh, pulmonary function uh, tests. In this presentation, my objective is um, to make um, a very simple talk about uh, spirometry and uh, its component. Also, I'm going to uh, give a little uh, bit of information about measurement of oxygen saturation using uh, pulse oximetry. I'm going to talk a little bit about blood gas and mainly the um, arterial blood gas. I'm not going uh, to go in details of that. And I'm going to give idea about CO2 monitor. So spirometry is um, a machine composed of a mouthpiece and a tube and then this connected through a sensor either to an actual machine or through a computer through a card and the data from this um, to, um, from this device are analyzed through a software. So the um, process or the uh, measurement start by asking the patient to take deep inhalation, then grab the mouthpiece uh, through his mouth or her mouth, and then ask them to do um, a quick and as fast as possible exhalation through a six seconds. And it's a good practice to repeat three times and take the mean for these readings to for the more a reliable result. The component of the spirometry is first one is the force expiratory volume in first second or FEV1, which is basically the volume of air exhaled in first second after full inhalation. And then the force vital capacity or FVC, which is the volume of air, the whole volume of air exhaled uh, after full inhalation. And then the ratio between both of these parameters, the FEV1 to FVC, which is the proportion of the uh, air exhaled in first second to the uh, air exhaled in the uh, full exhalation. And then the other component is 25-75% force expiratory flow. Uh, which is uh, the, uh, it's a self-explanatory, it represents 25 to 75% of the uh, uh, force expiratory flow after full inhalation um, and during uh, force vital capacity. It's a very sensitive tool and can be the only abnormal uh, parameters from the other uh, measurements of the spirometer. Now there is very important tool where we call it loops in the spirometer and loops mean comparing two parameters of the lung to make um, a graph. And in the spirometer we measure the flow to the volume or we call it flow volume loops to represent the relation of change of volume in relation to flow. So the graph here represents two um, part of the respiratory cycle. Here is the inhalation and here is the exhalation and the process starts in here where the um, the flow is increased in the first part and tremendously and because of that we have a very high volume because very high flow cause more volume and then the uh, flow uh, um, st the uh, flow start to decrease during which uh, the volume slightly decreases until the flow goes back to zero where we, we have small amount of volume remaining only the uh, functional residual volume. And after that we start with the exhalation where all the, uh, um, the volume of the air or the air of the end exhale quickly in the first seconds until we reach the maximum flow um, per second and then the flow dropped dramatically and quickly until we reach back to the um, and, and, and exhale all the air and reach to the uh, respiratory pause to start the new cycle of inhalation. And these are uh, different types of the um, uh, flow volume loops in different uh, lung condition. So normally we have a nice looking exhalation phase and also a nice looking inhalation phase, um, uh, an inspiration phase, sorry, and a nice looking um, expiration phase. And both of them give, give us a very nice uh, oval shaped loops. 
when we have um, a, a early small airway obstruction or lower airway obstruction, the um, the problem starts with the exhalation while we have almost normal inhalation. And um, the shape change from nice oval shape to convex second phase of expiratory phase. And when the obstruction become more severe, we have more severe blunting and convexity of the shape during exhalation. And there is a limited decrease of the inspiratory phase. Well, when we have the large or upper airway obstruction, there is planting and decrease in the size of the inspiratory phase because of the obstruction. At the same time, there is decrease of the expiratory phase. Where in, sorry, there is a um, significant planting of the inspiratory phase, but at the same time, there is a little bit of change in the, inspire, in the expiratory phase. Uh, well, when there is variable type of the airway obstruction upper and lower, we have significant decrease in the inspiratory part and planting of the shape, but also there is also decrease and little bit of uh, uh, planting of the of the expiratory phase. And all these shapes, you can see the volume almost remain same. The volume here measured the, from zero to here, from zero to here, from zero, always the volume is okay. Um, only in restrictive lung disease, both the flow in inspiration and expiration does not change much, but the uh, volume of the uh, of the air inside lung decrease, uh, restricted or become small, or hold the um, oval shape of the uh, flow volume uh, loops become very small. The other parameter of spirometer is what we call it a graph, and the graph is comparison of a lung parameter to the time, and here we're comparing the volume. So at start of inspiration, there is a huge increase of the volume very quick to reach the maximum volume in the first second. And there is after first second, there is a minimum uh, increase until about two seconds. After two seconds, there will be plateau or no change in volume uh, in compared to the time. And they give us nice convex shape of the, uh, of the uh, flow uh, of the volume graph. And this is a there's different type of graph. In the first one, which is the normal in black color, um, the graph um, there is increase in the volume in the first second, and there is minimum increase in the second second, and become plateau and through the rest of the inspiration. Well, when we have obstruction, there is very there is no sharp increase. There is very slow increase of the. Uh, of the of the uh, of the until we reach the full uh, full volume of the uh, uh, force vital capacity. However, in restrictive lung disease, there is a sharp increase, but it stop there, and then um, suddenly it becomes plateau, and the force vital capacity will not reach to the norm. So, how to read? is first to read the numbers and compare it to the loops and the graph. So there is a lot of number. Where to start? It's better way to start here, where there is FEV1 ratio to FVC. If this is normal, mean two things. Either both of these are normal or both of them are low. So this were either we are dealing, if this is normal, either we're dealing of normal lung or restrictive lung disease. Then we go to the force vital capacity. If it's low, as in here, 1.5 compared to the reference 2.75, then this is restrictive lung disease. If it's normal, then this is obstructive lung disease. If all these are normal, we go to FEF 25.75. If it's low, then it is uh, obstructive lung disease. So we can see here there is normal ratio and low FVC, so restrictive lung disease, but also we have low uh, FEV1 and low FEF2527 person. So a kind of um, restrictive lung disease with some obstruction. 
and if you look to the loops we can see that there is normal flow but the volume decreased so kind of restrictive lung disease and again if we look at the graph in blue in in, in red color we can see that there is normal or a um, little bit decrease of FEV1 but severe restriction of the uh, FVC again um, to read this first to start here if this is normal two things either normal lung or restrictive lung disease because either both of them decrease or both of them normal we go to the second part of the assessment FVC if the FVC is low then this is restrictive lung disease if FVC is normal then this is obstructive lung disease The, um, the second type or the second um, measurement of uh, pulmonary function test is the uh, measurement of oxygen saturation through pulse oximetry. The arterial oxygen component is the total amount of oxygen carried in the blood, both in the hemoglobin and that dissolved in the blood. So oxygen bound to hemoglobin plus that one dissolved in the blood component cause the um, um, or make up the component of arterial oxygen the oxygen bound to hemoglobin is the one measured by the pulse oximeter so pulse oximeter does not measure the blood or the oxygen in the blood that's part measured by uh, arterial blood gas so arterial blood gas equal to 1.36 times hemoglobin times the saturation measured by pulse oximeter this is represent the hemoglobin bound or the oxygen bound to hemoglobin plus the oxygen dissolved in the uh, blood which is uh, measured uh, by multiplying 0 0.003 times the um, arterial blood pressure arterial uh, blood or oxygen tension um, the um, Oxygen saturation is the percentage of oxygen bind to the hemoglobin from total hemoglobin. And because it's measured the hemoglobin percentage, it affects, and using a sensor, it affects by many core factors like dye, light, perfusion, and hemoglobin level. And there are many uh, portable uh, pulse oximeter. Example on this, you can see the oxygen saturation and heart rate, and also a graph representing of the respiratory cycle. The oxygen saturation measurement based on the formula uh, used to, um, um, uh, to draw the uh, hemo oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. And th that's why the oxygen saturation measured uh, by pulse oximeter can be affected by temperature, by pH, and um, the level of 2, 3 dPG. Uh, the um, oxygen saturation measured by pulse oximeter normal value is more than 94 in a term baby and in older children and it's about 88 to 93 percent uh, percentage in the preterm babies uh, depending on the gestation very important to remember that it measure the amount of the oxygen in blood or it measure the hypoxemia if the it's low it does not measure the tissue hypoxia so you might have uh, normal uh, oxygen saturation though you have tissue hypoxia and you might have abnormal um, oxygen saturation but no tissue hypoxia now the clinical sign of decreased oxygen and bind to hemoglobin or we call it cyanosis we have to have about five gram of uh, of hemoglobin without oxygen to see cyanosis and therefore, uh, cyanosis highly depend on the level of hemoglobin. So if the hemoglobin is 16, and we need about 4.5 for the cyanosis to appear, then this is about 30% of the uh, hemoglobin is not bound to oxygen to get cyanosis. And the rest, which is 70%, already bind to hemoglobin, which is the oxygen saturation. This totally change when we have different hemoglobin level. So at hemoglobin level of 4.8, it's about represent about 
60% of the hemoglobin. Therefore, the oxygen saturation would be 40%. So it's very important to know <coughs> the limitation of the uh, um, pulse oximeter when you use it. Very important thing that we use um, um, by using a pulse oximeter, which is the histogram. Histogram is a graph or table that represent the percentage of time from 24 hours or from any period spent in a certain saturation level. So for example, this child spent um, at a level of 94% saturation 200 minutes in the last 24 hours, which mean about 14% of his time in this level. And about 60% spent, he spent it in between 88 and 94, um, 94 uh, uh, percent saturation and likewise he spent 14 percent at this level eight percent at this level and four percent at this level and if we can see it in a, in a picture on a graph and you can see that most of his time spent it in the in this level which is kind of good we don't need to spend more time in here or more time in here um, and this is a very handy tool if we start to compare day by day so if each day the oxygen here is increasing and here is decreasing, we can have improvement. We can, if baby is on support, we can decrease the support. And if he's on low support, we can take him off support on room air. But if this is increasing by day to day, the percentage of, of uh, at 84, that's been the patient deteriorated and you need more support. So it's a kind of very handy tool to use the histogram from pulse oximetry to, and most of the machines now um, uh, can provide the, um, these uh, graph and percentages. Um, there are many factors affecting the other than the uh, percentage of the uh, oxygen bound to the hemoglobin. Uh, because it's a hemoglobin, so we need to hemoglobin to measure it's the percentage of oxygen bound to that hemoglobin. Uh, so the hemoglobin in the blood vessels are affected by the uh, perfusion, because if you have low perfusion, you have, we have left hemoglobin, which means we will not have effective oxygen uh, measurement or saturation measurement. Example in that, low perfusion heart failure, hypothermia, sepsis. Also, if you have an abnormal hemoglobin, like met hemoglobin, where the hemoglobin not in a state that can bind to um, oxygen, and you have less oxygen bind to the hemoglobin as in met hemoglobinemia, can be acquired, can be congenital. Another part is called carboxyhemoglobin, where the hemoglobin part of it start to attached to the oxy to the uh, carbon uh, carboxyl group and um, dissociate or um, remove the oxygen bind to it and then will give us abnormal uh, oxygen saturation the other important part of the pulmonary function test is arterial blood gas now indication of arterial gas are many it's so not assessing the example assessing the s base acid base status measurement of PA2 to see the oxygenation uh, part of the of the breathing, measurement of CO2 to see the ventilation part of breathing. Also, uh, we can assess the response to certain medication, example, giving insulin, diabetic ketoacidosis. Also, it can be used to detect uh, the abnormal hemoglobin, such as carboxyhemoglobin and methemoglobin. Also, it can be compared to the venous sample. And in comparing arterial to venous sample, we can get the oxygen uh, destruction or amount of oxygen going to the tissue. Now arterial is the best, but also we can measure the blood gas in the venous. But when we measure it in venous, we should not depend on the oxygen level on a venous blood sample. We can all use the CO2 and pH. And there is um, also, we can measure it in capillary when we don't have arterial access. And the capillary can give us a good idea about the pH, about CO2, and a little bit um, um, reasonable uh, uh, level of oxygen, but not as good as arterial. Uh, arterial are very good for oxygen level. There is um, absolute contraindication when we have abnormal Allen test. I'm going to ex explain it in a little bit. Or we have um, difficulty in accessing the site, like there is abnormal anatomy, or there is a skin breakdown, or there is uh, abnormal uh, uh, arterials or there is any treatment uh, intervention in that area or there is fistula that prevent us from accessing the um, artery to get the sample or when we have um, peripheral vascular disease or when you have an arinoid phenomena that basically there is these vessels are in spasm and cannot be accessed 
Um, the other absolute contraindication is the um, uh, you know, abnormal coagulation or there is thrombocytopenia. Obviously, when you puncture the artery in this situation, there will be severe bleed. So before um, um, puncturing an artery, whether it's by needle puncture or one-time puncture or what they call a stop, or putting continuous indwelling catheter to get the sample measure and get other blood sample, other blood sample for other tests and also monitoring the blood pressure, we have to do what we call it Allen test. And Allen test then first by elevating the hand for a, um, a few seconds and then occluding both radial and ulnar artery until the palm become uh, pale and then releasing the ulnar side and keep pressing on the radial side. If there is a good perfusion, that's mean there is a good collateral from ulnar, then you can go ahead and puncture the radial side. Um, now the side selection, uh, so this is very important to be done, the Allen test before puncturing the uh, artery to get the arterial sample, whether it's a one time or it's a continuous monitoring or indwelling catheter. There is radial artery, branchial artery, femoral artery, axillary artery, and dorsal artery, each has um, uh, the benefit, but also have um, you know the uh, drawback. Uh, I personally uh, prefer to do the radial artery and dorsal speeds artery because I have skill in doing that. Uh, now it's very difficult to determine the normal value, and when you say normal value, this is um, acceptable value. But does that mean if it's above or below, it's abnormal? Can be also acceptable, uh, but it's out uh, outside the normal limit for pH. The acceptable is 7.35, 7.45, although when you have a um, newborn, a premature, any result down to 7.25 is acceptable. The PCO2 is somewhere between 35 and 45, but um, when you have 50 and in a ventilated baby and other parameters are good and accept, does not, that does not mean, but this is a kind of range that help you assess. It's more difficult even um, to get normal oxygen. It might be more easier to get CO2 and normal CO2 and pH level, but it's very hard to get um, normal uh, oxygen level. And in my opinion, anything above 80 millimeter mercury of oxygen can be 95% normal. It doesn't mean that when you have 60 to 80 is not normal. I mean, a normal can also be acceptable as normal, but anything below 60, it would be um, uh, highly uh, highly abnormal or high likelihood being abnormal. The bicarb somewhere between 21 to 27. Basic cells give us idea of the metabolic status and um, um, it, um, uh, the uh, normal level is somewhere between uh, um, plus 4 to uh, between plus 4 to uh, minus 4 and the um, there are many other parameters that can be measured by the uh, uh, by the blood gas uh, like the hemoglobin like the uh, 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 electrolytes uh, but uh, one of the very important aspect of the arterial blood gas is measurement of lactate to give us idea about perfusion and metabolic status so in short, the arterial blood gas give us the idea about the oxygenation, whether there is hypoxemia or hyperoxia, and also the ventilation, whether there is, whether there is um, respiratory acidosis or um, a respiratory um, alkalosis. Uh, the other part of the uh, pulmonary function test is measurement of CO2. One of the most important element is non-invasive measurement of the partial pressure of CO2 in exhaled breath um, which is expressed at oxygen um, um, uh, as um, uh, carbon dioxide concentration over time. So we have here is the uh, carbon dioxide in millimeter mercury over time, and also it's called inside of CO2. So it starts by um, exhale when exhalation begin, the CO2 in the exhaled gas increase, increase until it reach below two over time, and then it reached maximum, and then when the inhalation start, the oxygen, uh, the, um, the carbon dioxide decrease until it reaches zero, and then the other cycle. Um, clinical, very important measurement of CO2 in the uh, exhaled gas. It can help us verify the AET placement, 
can be continuously monitoring the uh, correct intubation and resuscitation, especially during transport. Um, it can tell me how effective my uh, positive pressure ventilation, and it can tell me about the prognosis. If I have a normal uh, capnography or a normal CO2, that means I'm, I'm ventilating, that means there is a good circulation, that means there is a good ventilation. So it's very important in cardiac arrest. It's an indicator of regaining of uh, spontaneous circulation because without spontaneous circulation, even if you are doing ventilation, there will be no, no CO2. So to have CO2, we need a ventilation, which means uh, good perfusion and good um, inhalation exhalation. Titrating N-cytal CO2 level in patients suspected um, increase in trachea very important to um, control CO2 during measurement of the um, uh, of uh, management of the increase in tracranial pressure. Um, also have a, a very important component in prognosis of trauma patient, and it gives us idea that we are uh, ventilating the patient, especially patient conducted to, ventila to a ventilator. The other way to measure CO2 is by one time, or what we call it um, CO2 detector, and this used usually in resuscitation to um, and connected between the uh, endotracheal tube and the uh, uh, bag to when we ventilate the patient or with the ventilator to see the changing color for correct placement. So when there is yellow color and going back to uh, baseline color and then yellow color and bag, that means uh, there is um, effective ventilation and there is CO2 and that means there is a correct placement of the ATT. Other way of to monitor the CO2 is through tra transcutaneous. It's an invasive, indirect predictor of the amount of CO2 in the blood. And it's been increasingly used to measure the CO2, and it's an indirect indication of uh, good ventilation. However, there is a drawback of this because the electrode use causes some temperatures that there only might be a burn. Also, it need to change the site frequently to prevent uh, the skin breakdown and need frequent calibration and it might have um, sometimes false reading and many artifacts. Despite that, because it's a continuous monitoring, it's a very good tool to measure the CO2 and decrease the amount of the blood sampling to measure the arterial blood gas. Uh, by this, um, I'd end my this short talk about uh, pulmonary function test. I hope you like it.